as we started looking at quantum characteristics, the real problem is random number generation. And so if we were to, to jump in my DeLorean with my fully charged flux capacitor and, and drop back in time to like the early 2000s, uh, the, the limitations of pseudo random number generators became extremely obvious with some of the operating systems like uh, HP UX 10.2, right? So very powerful mini frame um, that was used by a, a lot of agencies. Uh, and, and it turns out that the random number generator that, that we use to base all of our security, only really, the, the random seed was pretty small. And so realistically, it only generated one of three numbers. <laughs> so uh, slightly guessable, and maybe not as secure as we wanted it to be. Uh, but but that started a whole field of study around how are we generating random numbers? Hello, and welcome back to the Cybrary Podcast. I'm your host, Will Carlson, Senior Director of Content here at Cybrary, joined again by a recurring guest uh, from Patero, uh, Ron Lewis. Ron, thanks so much for, for coming back on the show to enlighten me and the audience about uh, quantum, what's coming for quantum, and kind of you know, why it matters and what the impacts are. Hey, grateful to be here, Will. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me back. It's always nice to be invited back. <laughs> that's, that's a good harbinger, right? Absolutely. Um, so, and, and to that point, right, so we have, um, you know, we've already covered an episode talking about quantum and some of the initial thoughts and does it really matter? What's the event horizon or timeline for the impact of quantum as a cybersecurity professional and or specifically, I think leaders, why should you care and be watching quantum now? And then how long in advance should you be planning? Um, so we dive into a lot more detail there. We won't reboil that ocean. Uh, go back and watch the first episode where Ron joined us from Patero. Um, and we're going to have a couple more episodes as well to dive even further into quantum. But you know, I think the topic for today is just really to point out one singular thing, and that's that quantum has as many or more acronyms as cybersecurity law and DOD in general, right, Ron? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I was looking at all of the cues in quantum and uh, it feels a little bit like a Sesame Street episode, right? You know, today's episode is brought to you by the letter Q. <laughs> and the number's so big, you can't even calculate, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, you know, I wonder, in, in talking with you about this kind of before the episode today, th there's a little bit of a timeline here in the genesis of some of these acronyms. So, like, we, we have quantum as the original Q, I suppose, and then quickly from that, we start to add additional cues and additional acronyms, really aligned, I think, to kind of problems to be solved and ways that quantum can be implemented and, and solve some of those business problems. So I wonder if you could help me understand kind of in your mind where that all starts outside of the big Q quantum. What's the first Q acronym of, okay. of merit? So is, is that my cue to, you know, kind of start talking about quantum random number generators? <laughs> That, that, that we've we've built a queue of cues for you to talk about. So now you can kick off. That's your cue to start into the queue. Yes, awesome. absolutely. Fantastic. So yeah, so I always like to start with, okay, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And what was the initial problem that we're trying to solve? And so as we started looking at quantum characteristics, the real problem is random number generation. And so if we were to to jump in my DeLorean with my fully charged flux capacitor, and, and drop back in time to like the early 2000s. Uh, the, the limitations of pseudo random number generators became extremely obvious with some of the operating systems like uh, HP UX 10.2, right? So very powerful mini frame um, that was used by a, a lot of agencies. Uh, and, and it turns out that the random number generator that, that we use to base all of our security, only really, the, the random seed was pretty small. And so realistically, it only generated one of three numbers. <laughs> so uh, slightly guessable, and maybe not as secure as we wanted it to be. Uh, but, but that started a whole field of study around how are we generating random numbers? And, and the most common approach for, for generating random numbers is this pseudo random number generator that supposedly generates a set of numbers that, you know, you know uh, are not in a repeatable pattern for, for a, a finite length of time. And so we started looking at adding some randomness to the pseudo random number generator using stochastic uh, behaviors, you know, na natural patterns. So 
you know, how a user, you know, moves their mouse or flight time between keys. Um, but that, you know, wasn't really a, a very sufficient random number generator for, you know, highly secure uh, actions. And so we, we headed down the quantum path, right? And so uh, as, as uh, quantum mechanics and quantum physicists were looking at, well, how do we use what quantum behaviors do we use to, to and, and how do we interpret that into random number generators? Other scientists were like, well, there's much cheaper methods than quantum, you know, and so we came up with this whole field of true random number generators, you know, that were based on things like circuit noise, something completely unpredictable. Lava lamps. <laughs> lava, I love it. We should use lava lamps for random. That might be challenging. We might have to put several together. Actually, interestingly enough, so Cloudflare does that. Really? I did not know that. I'm going to have to go study that. That sounds like an interesting project. So, so an analog solution, right, to this digital random number well, problem. And, 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 and that's, that's probably a good approach because as we look at it from a quantum perspective, I have to ask the question, are quantum behaviors actually random? I mean, we, 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 we say they are. But if quantum behaviors are really random, how do we do the the quantum? Uh, how do we how do we look at values in superposition, and how do we do the, you know, the the math? And so it's it's kind of an existential question, right? And so and I, and I have to go back to L Lorentz law, right? And and Lorentz's theory of chaos, you know, so, some folks call it the butterfly effect, that everything is is mathematically uh, able to be computed because of of patterns. So, but but let's assume that for for you know, and, and D-Wave, for example, is a really good example uh, of, a, of a quantum random number generator. That's one of the things that D-Wave is, is focused on, right, in uh, 2020, 2021, 2022. Um, and let's assume, you know, that those quantum random number generators are actually random. And I guess no, no discussion of quantum random number generators would be um, complete without you know, I, I say, let's move on. But, but the next question is, how do you verify that the random number is actually random? And that's one of the big problems that scientists are trying to solve with quantum random number generators. It's like, how long before they actually start exhibiting a pattern? Um, and so we have quantum computers that are evaluating the randomness of other quantum computers. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it's kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting problem there. Yes. But Quantumception, if you will, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, quantum, quantum computers are taking over. Um, but let's assume that quantum random number generators are random. That brings us to a whole nother set of problems. Well, it's like, okay, so we've got this quantum, you know, quantum generated random number. And we've used it to create a key. Now, how do we get the key distributed? And so we go back to the whole no encryption discussion would be complete without mentioning Bob, Alice, and Eve, right? And so Bob wants to uh, share a secret message with Alice. And so they have to do this secure key exchange. And that's what the whole quantum key distribution problem is all about, right? Is is in quantum key distribution brings around a, a, a very interesting characteristic around uh, observation. Once someone eavesdrops on a quantum communication, that whole quantum communication is disrupted. Okay, so as a security guy, I go, "Hmm, sounds an awful lot like a, a great avenue for denial of service." I'm just going to start eavesdropping it. Nothing can, you know, nothing can be communicated. Um, so very interesting problem. But the challenge with quantum key distribution methods is it requires a whole new infrastructure. And so that's, that's one of, so now we've got these, these quantum, you know, random numbers that we've created quantum keys out of. And now we're building this uh, mechanism for, distributing quantum keys that's supposedly impervious to eavesdropping. And so Eve, by nature, is the eavesdropper, and she's listening in on Bob and Alice's communication. And so Bob and Alice use this quantum key distribution mechanism. But the challenge with quantum key distribution 
um, is that it requires a very mature telecommunications infrastructure. So you've got to have, you know, and that's that's great news for, you know, the tele- telecom industry, right? So it's like, hmm, this is a great use for dark fiber. Um, so. I wonder if you could allow me real quickly to kind of step back and make sure I'm I'm following and understand as far as you know the quantum random number generators the QRNGs like that's important as we're talking about encryption generally because um, so many of the algorithms that that do encryption are fundamentally no matter how complicated they are and and what prime numbers or n number of prime numbers they're based on it all originates from that first random number that kicks off that sequence and when you've got a sample set of three options <laughs> you're still ultimately limiting the sample set and so what we've had to do is make the encryption algorithms increasingly more complicated because of a lack of a random input a true random input at the beginning is that is that an accurate way to characterize it or would you get me back well, on the rails so, so 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 that is a very good way to characterize that but keep in mind that if you're if if the key is based on a guessable random number then your key is not secure I think the, um, the 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 statistical values of me guessing a number of three options accurate are probably pretty small, even though I'm a relatively simple person, right? Absolutely. So think of it like uh, teeth on a on a uh, on a physical key, right? And so, um, if and and I think about some of the like my grandfather's house had one of those old timey keys that had square. You know, we think of keys and they're they're pointed and, and jagged. And if you look at the old fashioned keys, they're just like square, right? And, and they're all the same size. And so that, that would be the difference between a, you know, a, a random number generator that is not statistically random. Think of, you know, it's a good, it's a good physical representation. Yeah. And I wonder if, if to kind of defer to that analogy, right? If, if, um, if we only have three options for pin positions in that lock, it doesn't matter how unpickable the lock actually is, you still only have to get three pins, right? Yeah, absolutely. There you go. And that, you know, we could have a long discussion about entropy, um, but that would like put every have half the listeners to sleep. <laughs> now, thank you for letting me uh, kind of divert there and make sure that I was following along accurately. And, you know, why is that true random number so important to yeah, and, and uh, I think algorithms? That, I think that, and, and if I'm continuing to follow it, maybe that you know, if the random numbers are truly random and they're big enough in and of themselves, that some of the the song and dance that we do to come up with encryption and decryption keys is a little bit moot because the number is random in and of itself and not guessable and, to your point, not even interceptable. Absolutely. And so then we get back to that whole, you know, I, I liken it to defense and death, right? And so the, the attributes of a good security solution, you know, starts... You know the, the you know the first line of defense is the randomness of your uh, your key. Right? So if your key is guessable, it's not secure, right? And so and then the next is making sure from a defense and depth perspective, making sure that you can exchange that key securely. And there's a bunch of different ways and a different bunch of different approaches. And QKD is one. And I go back to the, the analogy we used in the first podcast. You know, the, the Greeks came up with this great idea of, of stick and cloth. And they would take a, you know, a stick of varying lengths and varying thicknesses, and they'd wrap it in cloth and write the message on that. And on the distant side, you had to have a matching stick, you know. And so, um, and, and I think about, man, how did you, those sticks were your keys. And so the, the, the challenge was suddenly the, the Greek army had to, distribute all of these sticks securely. <laughs> it's it's probably the the predecessor to uh, KP or Kitchen Patrol, right? The anal- analogous, you're over there having to peel potatoes. I can see some poor private in the Roman army having to whittle sticks down <laughs> to the appropriate <laughs> yeah, width and length. To, to, and then somebody has to carry them. Got, got like, just like this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and some of those challenges, right? The key, the key distribution, that would be... Uh, the key distribution challenge, right? It's like, uh, okay, got to get this guy on on whatever mode of transportation, and make sure that these sticks don't fall into enemy hands, right? So, um, and it's funny because once once the uh, uh, the Romans figured out how the Greeks were doing their encryption, it was 
just a matter of hey, let's keep trying sticks until we get them until we can read them <laughs> read the message. <laughs> and that goes back to that randomness, right? So, uh, how random are the sticks? So. And, and so, I, I guess then the, the is the the crux of the of quantum key distribution is it the fact that it's not interceptable and, and it leans into that particular piece of quantum, or or are there other benefits and values to uh, you know how quantum goes about solving that? distribution problem. Yeah, so so the, the primary benefit of, of quantum key distribution is the fact that it's impervious to eavesdropping. And and it's very challenging. So the, the, the key distribution quantum key distribution is based on modifying the, the properties of how we bend the light um and in the the, the the photo optics from a quantum perspective. The challenge to that, and so think of like a prism. Um, and then a prism with a hole in it that only allows a, a photon to flow through when that uh, when that filter is oriented in a specific manner. Uh, and so uh, someone that's trying to eavesdrop would have to recreate the position of that filter in time. So it becomes a very challenging, uh, and it's double blind. So neither Alice nor Bob know the position of their uh, quantum filters, if you will. Uh, and so, so their their quantum version of the stick, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so very very interesting and and very challenging to do. But again, that you in order to do that correctly, you have to have a very robust, a very mature uh, telecommunications. If you're using photons, your your fiber has to be pristine. And so there's there's challenges there, right? So using dark fiber, um, the cost of that. And then it takes specialty equipment that's operating on a quantum level. And so you have to retool your infrastructure uh, around QKD. And NIST, NIST has a, a pretty interesting set of guidance on QKD. And, and they're, they're uh, cautioning practitioners to maybe hold off on QKD deployment until some of the challenges with QKD have been solved. So uh, some of the challenges are how do you verify, you know, the, the security of the QKD uh, solution? And, and that's, that's challenging uh, because you're having to evaluate it from a quantum perspective. And so what, what, what levels of expertise, how do you verify the level of expertise? How do you verify the data? I mean, all of it is, is highly specialized. And so those, those are some of the challenges that the, the NIST has kind of identified on their QKD post. Which almost brings us to PQC and, and hybrid P, P, PQC. Boy, that's hard to say this close to Christmas. So, and so it's interesting that as you as we start going through the alphabet soup, if you will, mm -hmm. so, you know, quantum. Everything is quantum. You know, talking about random number generators and the importance of that brings us to the the secure distribution of keys, and we talked about quantum key distribution as a, as a method, right? And we talked about, you know, uh, the uh, in, uh, making, you know, key QKD being difficult for eavesdropping. And we talked a little bit about the NIST and, you know, the, the NISC uh, raising issues around um, verifying the security of the, the QKD. And the NIST is kind of leaning towards this uh, post-quantum cryptography and where we're, where the idea is using specific algorithms uh, in that are more traditional encryption but that are uh, very difficult to solve with quantum computers uh, and we should probably talk a little bit about the d-wave here because um, I've seen uh, ideas around the d-wave being able to uh, run shores uh, and potentially Grover's algorithm, I don't know that it can do that today, right? So the other interesting note is, you know, we hear D-Wave talked about as a, a quantum computer, but it's actually not a computer at all. Um, and, and those are fighting words, right? <laughs> <laughs> but but it's actually more, you know, uh, from, from a, a compute theory, it's actually more of a calculator because it's designed to solve specific 
uh, or perform specific calculations. And so it's a, a, a very fast, very efficient quantum calculator. Uh, and so, can and any we quantum physicists watching the show today that want to voice their complaints, make sure to reach out to Ron Lewis at Patero directly. We'll include his. I'm, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, so yeah, and, and 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 I'll provide references for that that we can put in the chat, you know, so that the the angst can be aimed at at the scientists that that actually said that. So, um, but yeah, and so very interesting. Um, but from a uh, post-quantum cryptography perspective, NIST is recommending an approach uh, more along the lines of uh, a hybrid, you know, so using, you know, and, and, and today there's several algorithms that the NIST is looking at, right? So we started with seven, I think we're down to four now. Um, and, and Kyber, uh, Crystal's Kyber is, is probably the most common. And we see that in the market today. Uh, based on elliptic curve cryptography, uh, which is traditionally very hard for a quantum computer to solve using Shor's algorithm. And then I, I go back to kind of what we talked about in the first podcast where we said um, the challenge with, there's, there's two different types of, of encryption, typically asymmetric and symmetric, asymmetric being a key pair um, and uh, symmetric keys, which are shared keys. Mm -hmm. and, and we go back to um, quantum computers and Shor's algorithm are, are targeting the asymmetric keys. And largely because you can take the public key, because it's public, and you can use it as a starting point for Shor's algorithm. And you can do your, uh, I say for your, um, my, my colleagues say Fourier, right? And so, you know, doing, doing quantum Fourier transforms to derive that private key. Uh, and so with a symmetric uh, keying algorithm, the challenge is really Grover's. Uh, and we go back to Grover's being able to take a set of intercepted keys uh, and then derive the, the, the right key to decrypt the uh, encrypted transmissions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So is it, is it fair to say then that we're, what, what NIST is recommending really drives at the heart of that problem, right? So great, we've got this really fancy, actually truly random, we think we're working on it, number, we could distribute it using quantum, but that may not be the best way to do it. So our options are either quantum just doesn't matter and has zero impact until we solve that problem, or we try to find another way to leverage that benefit because others are going to be doing the same using some distribution methods that we already have in place today that don't have those infrastructure hangups that you mentioned from a, a complexity standpoint. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic summary. Well, yes, absolutely. And and do you think, you know, I know we talked last time about, you know, the, the shortening event horizon of when quantum may begin actually measurably impacting organizations is, are some of these things, and I guess primarily that um, that that hybrid post quantum model, really what's driving the shortening of that? Because we've decided collectively that you know maybe some of these problems are going to be much harder to solve in longer term. But let's take benefit where we can take benefit, Absolutely. mitigating where we can. Yeah, and that that brings up a really good discussion, right? Let's talk about te technology evolution and how that happens. And so, you think about. Okay, so Henry Ford invented the automobile in what, 1903, 1904, so early 1900s. Um, but there was no infrastructure. And, and interestingly enough, you know, what, what made way for the automobile wasn't roads, street lights and street signs and all of that. But actually it was, and it took 20 years and it was a, a complete change of the way that we looked at consumer credit. And so you can thank Henry Ford for Consumer credit, credit cards, credit card debt, all of that. You know, thank you, thank you, Henry Ford. But that took 20 years and it took, you know, and then it took another 20 years for, you know, roads and street lights and traffic signals and all of that. I mean, you think about all of the laws and, and, and whatnot that had to be put in place. And then we fast forward to a, another technology adoption. And so cell phones. I don't know if you remember the advent of cell phones, but, you know, cell phones um, came out in the, what, 1990s? Um, you know, pro prototyped in the late 80s and then introduced on a larger scale in the 1990s, you know, and, and then we see all the commercials like AT&T, more bars in more places um, and, uh, and rolling out towers and all of that. 
you know, just to get the 2G, you know, t- took into the 2000s and then in 2010. Every 10 years, we had a, an evolution of cell phones until, you know, 2020 when we get 5G. And it's interesting. I think we see that pattern happening in a lot of places, right? I, I, I am personally very interested in chicken or the egg problems like this. It's like, well, we don't have the infrastructure for it. I think electric electric vehicles are another really interesting one, right? So I think, you know, without there being a preponderance of electric vehicles on the street, we're probably not going to solve, for a number of reasons, the infrastructure problem that ultimately really supports them well. And if so then you just don't make electric vehicles. You just wait until the infrastructure supports, but then miraculously the infrastructure never comes around to support them in the first and, place. So somebody's got to take that first step. Right, and so there seems to be this trend of there has to be a product in the market, a viable product in the market. And so I go back to, and so, uh, you know, the, the number one question that I get, and it's kind of interesting, is like, is quantum real? And, and, and you know, they look at me and they, they, the expected answer is yes. <laughs> right? And so I always go, no, it's not. It's not real. You know, and, and and the look of shock, you know, and it's like, wait, what? What do you mean quantum's not real? No, quantum's not a thing. <laughs> you know, and then and then I caveat that, you know, realistically, quantum is not real in the sense that you know, that is thought about today. It's like the the, the thought of quantum is like, when's it gonna pop out? You know, when's it going to suddenly materialize and, and affect me? <laughs> and it's like quantum isn't going to affect you like that, right? So what we see is this slow and steady, much like the cell phone, you know, how we, you know, bag phones. I don't know if you're old enough to remember oh, bag I phones. I remember bag phones and car phones. And, and yeah, car absolutely. And you, you have a purse, you know, it's not, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a man bag because it has a cell phone. <laughs> and they were black leather. They were a really great accessory. Absolutely. Yeah. And 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 match my shoes, great. So you know, and it's it's just amazing to me how quickly it it seems like the cell phone technology evolved, but it was like ten years. But it had to start with the bag phone, right? And I love watching uh, some of the older movies from the '80s, and you see these guys on these you know giant cell phones, <laughs> the big Motorola with the, the fixed antenna, the thing, the, yes, you know, and you pull the antenna out, you know, and you hold it to your like. You know, and then and then you know, and look at what we have today. And this is a fairly large, older iPhone, right? So, um, not like the new, uh, uh, what is it, the Motorola flip phone? Yeah. You know, yeah, the folding phone. Oh my gosh, it's come so far. I wonder here too if, you know, I think in this space and having talked to a number of cybersecurity professionals, and and we talked about this in the last episode, there seems to be a pretty broad spectrum of people's belief about quantum and its impacts from people that just trivially trivially don't care or don't think it's going to show up to those that are you know the word we used in the last episode was that we're chicken little uh, about it a little bit and they're just it's a harbinger of the end of the world here and and i think some of what is a challenge for the people that i've talked with is that they just don't know what to consider as true but what i'm kind of hearing from you is that in some ways it is a little bit of d all the above right so quantum's not just going to pop out fully formed and ready to impact the world. And we haven't seen that across many technologies that impact us, if we're being realistic, to the examples that we just gave. And yet, that doesn't mean that it's not going to have impact either. I mean, if you look at the progression from, shoot, all the way from pagers, like as the the predecessor of predecessors, to some of the infrastructure being in place to begin to support even the idea of something like the the phones that we carry around in our pockets today, like it has to start somewhere. And I think what I'm hearing you say is that cybersecurity professionals pay attention because it is starting and it may look like a pager today and not a cell phone, but it, it's happening and it's moving and it, it's not a dead thing. And, and, and all those things that you read could likely be true at the same time. And so what we have is we've got a bunch of different um, schools of thought that are flooding the market with quantum, hence the uh, you know alphabet soup when we talk about quantum. And, and what we're trying to do is quantify things in you know logical groupings of of of, of cues, you know. Um, and there's no set standards yet. And so NIST is trying to tackle that. And they're going well. There's PQC, and there's probably five different approaches to just PQ, PQC alone. And PQC and then, being post quantum computing, po- po- post quantum cryptography, cryptography. Thank you. So post quantum cryptography, 
Um, and then you've got the two schools of thought, right? There's the the quantum key distribution, and then there's the traditional, you know, embellished for post-quantum resiliency. And those are the two fundamental kind of buckets that the NIST has created. But we have all of these different companies that are, you know, Patero and American Binary, and you know, and, and it's it's funny because there's projects like Falcon and uh, uh, Iothec. I mean, there's there's all of these folks that are entering the market with these unique ideas around how to do um, quantum resiliency and how to address the quantum threat. And there's there's really it's kind of interesting to watch uh, as the the market is so noisy right now. And then the NIST is trying to superimpose some standards. It's like, okay, it's either in this bucket or it's in this bucket. And there's several things to kind of look at um, as you start, you know, trying to figure out what the right solution is with all these cues. You know, yes, random number generator is incredibly important. But what about quantum ram- random number generator as a service? That's a thing. And there's a whole perspective in the market that says, as long as I can get a random number a truly random number uh, that my encryption will be secure and it'll take several quantum computers working simultaneously and in conjunction to figure out my, my random number, right. Or, or to violate my key. And so there's that school of thought. And then there's the, well, how do I take this random number from this quantum random number generator and how do I effectively insert it into my encryption solution and so there's encryption providers that are taking input as a quantum random number generator from a quantum random number generator as a service. And there's that whole market there, you know, and it's like, well, is that the right solution? Well, it kind of depends on, you know, what your business can tolerate and where you are. And then there's the, the, the other aspect of, well, um, I've got a quantum random number and I'm going to use a quantum key distribution method because I have m- mature telecommunications. I've got, you know, dark fiber dedicated to that. And so from a business perspective, is that, is that the right solution for me? Well, there are several things you have to kind of keep in mind is, is you know, do I, do I have the budget? Do I have the need? Does the need justify the cost? And then what is the time commitment to deploy this across my infrastructure? Because you're essentially retooling your, your infrastructure on an enterprise scale. And then you go back to, well, I don't know that quantum is a threat today. Do I really want to invest so heavily in a quantum solution? What's the middle ground? And so, and then you, you see all of the PQC solutions that are flooding the market today. And you have to ask yourself, well, how do we verify, you know, the, um, the security of the solution of the crypto algorithm. And then there's a whole bunch of other things that I, that I always recommend that you look at. Right. And so, so um, having a very strong random key is fantastic. Provided that you have enough compute (laughs) to negotiate the key and, and actually use the key. And then you have to start looking at, well, you know, latency, what is the impact of latency, you know, from a compute overhead perspective. And that's a pretty heavy penalty. Um, and then the other thing that I think, you know, you should look at from a business perspective is if you're using PQC, what's your network, what's your, what's your um, tolerance for network disruption? Because your, you know, your network isn't always solid. And some of the challenges with traditional, you know, think about a VPN. What, what happens if you, there's a blip in the wire, a blip in the signal? It's like, um, please reconnect to your gateway. And it's it's so interesting to me, right? So so much of this goes back to I think what are really business fundamentals and 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 organizations and primarily I think senior leaders knowing what it is that they're protecting, what it's worth spending to protect that information, and then what they're protecting it from. And I think you hit on a number of those things, right? Like we talked about a number of things, or you did that were, you know, you need to evaluate the net cost of these things. And you know, I know we goes without saying that you don't want to spend half a million dollars protecting a quarter of a million dollars of stuff. That just doesn't make any sense at all, or mitigating a quarter of a million dollar risk. So you have to right-size the solution to the risk and the risk appetite of the organization. But I think you mentioned another one that was interesting to me, and that's, you know, what are you protecting against? So are you using and hoping that 
quantum, regardless of its implementation, protects you from conventional threats? Or are you trying to use quantum to protect you from quantum threats? And how that shows up for an organization could be dramatically different. But at the end of the day, as a leader, as a cybersecurity professional, you need to know the answers to those questions before you even begin to pick any enabling tech to uh, align to those kind of organizational goals at large. Yeah, that, and, and that's critical, right? I mean, you can't pick the right solution without understanding the requirements. And, and it's funny because I see a lot of companies, uh, security guys are really bad, bad at this, right? Because it's like, we must secure everything at any cost. Yes. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and that goes back to the chicken little discussion, right? It's like, um, but pragmatically, it's, it's and, and, and I use this analogy of there's a house on the top of a hill, you know, and it's got to have something valuable in there because, it, the, the, you know, the, the owner has put cameras everywhere, gates, he has a, a, you know, concertina wire around the top of the fence, he's got dogs, you know, and, and you and, and alarm systems and you break into the house and you get into a safe and you open the safe and what's in there is a cheeseburger. You know, it's like, <laughs> and so it's like, why is he protecting this cheeseburger? You know, because um, it was important to him. But you know, you, you have to go back to you know, am I, am I putting the right controls in place to 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 you know to provide the right level of protection for what I'm protecting, and and certain things, you know, and and so that, that's the whole discussion about the steal now, decrypt later. Um, is, is is what's being taken going to be of value in seven years? You know, so time series data, for example, how valuable is, is encrypted time series data decrypted seven years from now, 10 years from now? Uh, probably, you know, probably not as valuable as a social security number, for example, that, that, that lasts what, you know, 40, 60, 80, 100 years. Yeah, yeah, that's the other thing I was going to say, you know, as as a as a senior leader or cybersecurity professional, understanding the the useful life of the data that you have to protect. Um, you know, and I, I think that's not something that I find comes up in even in data classification discussions for at least private organizations. I would hope that the government entities are having that discussion. But even if it's a, a, a an item that's of national security interest because it's intellectual property about a weapons system, like it's only going to need to be protected at that level for a certain period of time. So even having an understanding of how long is it that we need to protect this thing should inform the, the, the solution that you're putting in place as a strategic leader to protect that particular item. It makes me think of you know, when CDs and CD burners first came around and everybody's like, oh, put everything on a CD. But they ended up being totally blind of the fact that CDs have, you know, on the spectrum of things, a relatively short, useful life um, and are probably not the best option for archiving of data that needs to be accessible for a long period of time. And sorry, these big old messy magnetic tapes might still be the best solution. A absolutely. And it's funny that you say that because I think about paper records, right? So um, I was one of these guys in the military that was like, print everything. Print everything because it, it, you, it won't get lost if it's printed. You know, and it's funny because if you think about what toner actually is, you know, toner will fall off the page after a certain amount of time. And so, or they, the pages stick together and you, it's like, hey. <laughs> I can vividly hear the sound in my head of pages <laughs> sticking like, together of toner. Mm. And, and it's funny because you mentioned, you know, CDs and, and you know, I, I, I have some older Ubuntu CDs that I tried to load just for grins on an older machine. And it's like, ah. Oh, I've, I've, you know, they, they've, they've passed their useful lifetime, you know, cause they're, you know, a little over 20 years old. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting, right? So that, that gets down to the physics of what a CD is and that little tiny foil layer sandwiched between those two little pieces of plastic. All it takes is just a one bit difference off. And yeah. you, all of a sudden your Ubuntu machine is corrupt and it's not going to load anymore. It's just. And, and then the other, the other discussion around what's the, you know, so data classification, um, we, we often talk about, well, what, what type of data is it? But the other thing to keep in mind is also what is the impact of, of disclosure? And so like a credential, for example, a credential that a high value credential that gets compromised, you know, is different, right? And so encrypted military communications. 
encrypted military communication. There you go. Which would which would you know be be a great great fodder for a tour discussion, <laughs> you know, and how the tour was birthed out of the navy. But um, but uh, but yeah, and so I mean, so understand again. Going back to okay, so quantum random number generators, quantum random number generator as a service, uh, quantum key distribution. We we covered a whole bunch of cues, and then uh, quantum or, or post quantum cryptography and then there's this other one that's called hybrid post quantum cryptography which is just another way of you know saying uh post quantum cryptography there's almost no difference between the two right because we're we're taking you know post quantum cryptography as a hybrid approach anyway <laughs> yeah, one may be just a little bit more clear but effectively your point is that the same thing here the same kind of expression yeah. uh, same solutions in that particular bucket so. Well, Ron, as always, this has been super, super interesting. Again, you know, the, the point here is to, to, to further the discussion in the cybersecurity space of, you know, bridging the gap, I, I hope, between those that are totally lackadaisical about quantum and its impacts and those that are absolutely chicken little about it and admit that, you know, if we all align to the reality that the event horizon for the impacts of quantum for the reasons that we've discussed today and many others is shorter than we think. We need to understand at whatever level is material for your role. Um, I don't think Ron or myself are advocating for everybody going out and having a, a quantum physicist on staff to help understand this. I think I don't need to be a mechanic to understand how to operate my car. Uh, admittedly, but I do need to understand a fair number of basics to figure out what problems that car solves for me or what kind of car that I ultimately need. And I think that's that's the call here today is, you know, understand quantum better, understand your business well enough to know where you should be looking for solutions like quantum to impact your organization and where quantum, if you do nothing, could also impact your organization. So, um, Ron, thank you so much for joining us today. I wonder if you have any parting thoughts or things I missed kind of in my my summary there. Uh, your summary was great. The, the only other thing that I would add is understand the characteristics of your infrastructure and limitations as you start looking at how you're going to secure and then, and then calculating in what is the cost if you have to retool your infrastructure. A hundred percent. Thank you so much again, Ron. I'm looking forward to the next two conversations and, and have a, a great end of the year and, and start of the next. Thanks, Will. Have a great day.